So, good morning. First of all, I'd like to say thank you, Lele, for this amazing opportunity to share some ideas, data, hypotheses. And the first thing I need to mention that I am a forest guy, <laughs> but I decided to talk about grasslands. Not a so beautiful grasslands as you, you see, but uh, the moment when uh, uh, Lele invited me and I saw all the experts. I am the only one that works with forests. I mean, Giselda also works with forests. And yeah. <laughs> and so I decided to talk about abandoned pastures, so it's anthropogenic pastures, and, but they represent an amount of land very significant in the Atlantic rainforest. And in some cases, these abandoned pastures return to the forest, so are resilient, and in other cases, don't. So, the title is Arrested Succession in Abandoned Pastures in the Brazilian Atlantic Forest. What comes next and what about the consequences for ecological restoration? The first thing that I'd like to highlight is this figure uh, of a very nice paper from Arroyo uh, Rodriguez that they show exactly the idea of arrested succession. It's not a new idea. Arrested succession have been documented in the Mediterranean ecosystem, the tropical ecosystem, in several other ecosystems. So the idea is a system may abruptly driven toward a slow going successional state. So something very slow, stuck it. Okay? In this figure, we can realize in this axis, this unpredictability of successional pathways, successional trajectory. So it's this line here, so I'm sorry, this line here, so very predictable, unpredictable, and very predictable again. And here you have human caused modifications in the landscape, the degree of degradation. So here you have low degradation, the succession is very predictable, and the velocity of secondary succession, which means resilience, it's very high. Okay? So, in the intermediate state, we have the peak of unpredictability. Things can go very well or don't. So, succession can happen or not. Okay? And in this part here, we have the worst scenario to forest, I mean. Why? Because we have highly degraded ecosystem, low velocity of secondary succession, and a very predictable, but predictable it's good. No, because it's predictable because it's too simple, it's degraded, so it's not good, okay? So this is the scenario of vast areas of abandoned pastures in the Atlantic rainforest. I come from Rio, and here there is a, a watershed, a zone, the Valle do Paraíba. It's dominated by landscapes like that. So pastures and pastures and pastures. Most of the people, I mean common people, not biology, forestry, most of them believe that that landscape are natural. Some of them say, what a beautiful landscape. No, it's not beautiful. It's African grasses, grasses, so it's simple. It's poor in terms of species richness. So we have a, a big amount of areas covered by landscapes like that. So why this is important? So this is one few uh, simple example. I think that Giselda and Alessandra to uh, be part of this study, the study of this policy briefing, uh, not to the Atlantic Forest, but the Cerrado and the Pampa, this policy briefing was launched in 2016, I think, was done by the Environmental Ministry, and the Environmental Ministry at the time are very interested in know the potential of natural regeneration. So what kind of areas can be restored in the passive way? Because it's low cost, so it has the cost benefit, it's very high. So we expand two or three or four meetings discussing these, these ideas. Now, he, here I show you only the Atlantic rainforest studies, but we have the Cerrado studies, the Pampa, policy briefing. It's free, this is the link, so you can download these studies. So, in this study, 
the group of experts decide, and I am part of that group four years ago, now I'm not sure if I'm so optimist, optimist like, like that, but that 41% of the anthropic, anthropic areas in the, in the Atlantic rainforest show intermediate or high ecological resilience. So all the areas, the green areas and the yellow areas, are high resilient areas, which means that we can restore using passive restoration, using natural regeneration. So forget about planting, forget about everything. So looks like a very great news. So it would be cheap, it would be easy to restore. So all this uh, map, all this data, this, this map are generated based on modeling rainfall proximity to the forest remnants and land use, pastures, agriculture. So field data, no, we don't have field data. We never calibrate the model, we never test the model if these areas are really have the high resilience or not. And this is danger, okay? So uh, now I will show you a study, a case study that the area is exactly like here, and in that study shows that the area has a high resilience. So let's check the data in the field to verify if the environmental ministry study, our study, I'm part of them, we are right or not. So this case study uh, was performed in the post Santos Biological Reserve was a reserve that was established in 1974. This protected area was created to protect the golden lion tamarind, and so it's a very important uh, protected area. At the moment that they establish this protected area, 40% of the area are covered by pastures, okay? But we have, here the image is not so good, we have I mean, a big amount of forest too, and all these green areas, more clear green, are pastures. But we have forests that are close to the pastures. So they believe at that time that, okay, let's establish the area at pastures today, but in a couple a decades, something like that, the forest will, will, back, will be back, it will be easy. So 30 years after, the pasture is still there. Even considering the high rainfall, so it's, we don't have a, a drought season in that area. The proximity to old growth forest, to increase the seed rain, for example, but the pasture is still there. So we start to study this area in 2006, and, and we have here a kind of fire gradient, I mean the fire frequency gradient. So you have three different areas here, one, three areas like here that burn in the 90s. So you have one fire event, intermediate, that's not so intermediate, but burn three times in the 90s, 93 and 2002 in the high fire frequency area with four fire events that burn in all these periods. So it's just the site. So in all the sites, we have big permanent plots, and we have been monitoring vegetation structures, species richness, and functional traits in all these, these areas. OK? So it's very important to highlight forest. Here it's, I don't know, 50 meters. So we have old growth forests near to all this abundant passion. So hypothetically, these areas must be forest in a very, uh, in a very, uh, very shortly. So let's take a look at some of the data. Uh, here, I will show you first data. It's very important data, C4 grass cover. So in the high fire frequency, we have almost uh, all the, the ground layer are covered by C4 grass cover, most of them exotic species, I will show you. So in the intermediate, in the low, the, of course the grass cover decreases a lot, but even so in some sites we have a peak of areas covered by the grasses. We have trees in the area, 
and we still have grasses. It's something that doesn't match. For example, when we check the leaf area index, we can show that the leaf area index is a very predictable uh, way to predict, to, to show that the fire frequency, the high fire frequency, the, the intermediate and the low is increasing. And here we have, it's important, I forgot to mention, the old growth forest, like the reference ecosystem. Here, it's a completely different ecosystem, but it's a good way to, to, to show how different are these communities, okay? So, we have the increase of leaf area index and the decrease of C4 grass, the, the grass cover, okay? We have the abundance of resprout, also in this in tree resprout in these areas. And we also have a functional trait here. It's the community weighted means of the bark thickness of all these sites. So, as you can see here, we have communities in all the areas affected by the fire with species with a very thick bark. It's not so common in the Atlantic rainforest or in Amazon. Most of the species in the forest biomes doesn't have a thick bark. In the Cerrado, we know that. Okay? So, let's see the communities. So, this area here, it's a high fire frequency area. This photograph was taken two years after the fire event, the last fire event in 2010. So, we have two tree species that represent 90% of all trees in the area. The first one is uh, Asteraceae, Mokiniastro polymorph, and the second one is uh, Melastomatase, Miconia albicans. Okay? So, the Asteraceae has a very thick bark, as you can see here, and the ability to resprout. And what about the grasses? The grasses have two species, Melinis minutiflora and Imperata brasiliensis. So, this is how these areas look like. Every time that I show this picture and I, people ask, this area, it's a tropical forest or it's a savanna? Most of them say it's a savanna, probably in Brasilia, in Minas. Because of that, we decide, and I will calm down, I decide to name this area, we decide to name this area as a savanna-like ecosystem. A savanna-like means an area or a community that looks like a savanna, but it's not a savanna. It's important to mention. Okay? So it looks like, but it's not a savanna, real savanna, rich savanna, okay? But looks like, okay? So let's check now if that areas are real, arrested or not. So you have some data in three different periods, so 2006, 2012, and 2018 for basal area, species richness, and functional diversity. Let's check some of the data. So, even with one fire event, basal area doesn't increase. So, 12, 15, 14. Species richness, 12, 18, 20, a little bit. Richness, nothing. So, of course, it's only 12 years. Probably, if we have been, we will be falling in this area for 20, for many years, we are possible to fall in. But 12 years, it's, it's, uh, it's not a long period, but as you see in the Chehi talk and the Elise talk, even in the Mediterranean ecosystem, 10 years could be something very important to change. So here in the tropical areas, with that climate, nothing changed in 12 years. So it's something very important. And of course, in areas that burn four times, in some cases, change a little bit more, but then, for example, the species richness is very, very low. So here you can realize that they're stuck it, they are rested, nothing change in this in this area. Also, when we check in terms of uh, functional traits here, the community where it means considering all the traits and considering different periods, so. 
two years after fire, the high fire frequency, eight years after fire, so six years later, 10 years, 16 years, and here the low, so 16 years, 22 years, so nothing really changed. Considering these axes that represent 55% of all variation, it's the same. Even in this year, it's the same. Here, a little bit more, and here's the old growth forest. So in terms of trajectory, they are coming to this side, not to that side. Okay? So my last, my final slide I received yesterday. It's uh, a, a data, I have a new uh, student that started his, his PhD this year, Pablo. And Pablo, it's very interesting in understanding the monodominance pattern in the Atlantic rainforest. And we decided starting uh, a case like that, with the Mokiniasum polymorphum, became a dominant species in the Porto das Antas, but not only in the Porto das Antas reserve. It's not a, a, a typical case that only happens there. So he started to mapping other areas that also present the same pattern. I mean, uh, abundant passion that are dominated by one species. And, and in his first field work, he was able to map 67 areas, these red dots here in the Rio de Janeiro states, in the Espírito Santo states, 67 areas that show the same pattern. They are dominated by the Mokiniasum polymorphum used to be used as a passions and now are dominated by this single species, only one species. So, of course, the species, it's a widespread species, the black dots here, it's all the occurrence, uh, occurrence areas on the species occur, so occurs in the Pampas, in the Cerrado, in the Atlantic rainforest, in the Caatinga, so it's a super tramp species, it's a ruderal species we can, we can mention, but that species has the functional traits of savanna species, the thick bark, the anemocore, so it dispersed very, very fast. So now we have all these areas here that we will start study more properly, uh, implant some permanent plots in all these areas to check if the pattern that we have been observing in the Posto das Antas also happens in all these sites. But at the moment that he sent me this map, I remember this paper that was published in 2011 in the science by Marina Irota when they modeling the global resilience of tropical forests. And all these yellow dots here, they mentioned that forests with low resilience is predicted to be most likely turn into a savanna or a tree-less ecosystem. So, Grasslands probably will increase, but the sad thing is not the rich grasslands in terms of species richness, the degraded grasslands, like the case that I show you here. So when you check the same areas where the paper showed that can became a treeless or a savanna ecosystem, match with the area that Pablo just uh, mapped in last month. Okay, so the main question now, as Thierry mentioned, probably it's a novel ecosystem, it's something very different. So it's stable, probably it's resilient. So how to deal with this ecosystem? Should I expend money to restore these areas or not? So this ecosystem can be good to resist to fire what about the role of this ecosystem to provide ecosystem service? We don't know. We know that they are poor in terms of species richness, so they are not interesting, poor in species richness, species comp composition is completely different to old growth forests, but how to deal with these new ecosystems? So, I don't know. Thank you very much. <laughs>